Gonna come at this whole world round is gonna come round down as they ball. Gonna come down. There's only one side to it. Down. Gonna come we kill the world. Gonna come at this whole world round is gonna come down as they ball. Gonna come down. There's only one side to it. Down. Gonna come at this whole world round is gonna come down as they ball. Gonna come down. There's only one side to it. Gonna come down. There's only one side to it. Gonna come down. There's only one side to it. Gonna come down. There's only one side to it. Gonna come down. There's only one side to it. Gonna come down. There's only one side to it. Gonna come down. There's only one side to it. Gonna come down. There's only one side to it. Gonna come down. There's only one side to it. Gonna come down. There's only one side to it. Gonna come down. There's only one side to it. Gonna come down. There's only one side to one of the things I'm most concerned about right now is the survival of the human race at a time of increasing climate change, globalization, and a clash of cultures that's happening all over the world. Recently, I was offered a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I was invited by close friends to visit a remote village in northeastern Brazil to participate in a traditional cassava harvest. I, of course, accepted. It turned out to be one of the most amazing adventures I've ever experienced. And now I'm going to take you along on that journey. My dear friend, Julie Herata, is a Brazilian woman who happens to be on an epic journey, bicycling from, get this, the top of Alaska to the bottom of Argentina, all alone. The first Brazilian woman to do so. The trip is likely to take about five years. Halfway through the trip, however, while descending a volcano on her bicycle in Costa Rica, she had an accident in which she injured her shoulder. As a result, she was forced to take a break from cycling and return home to Brazil to recuperate for several months. While she was home, she and her parents planned to make a trip to visit her mom's ancestral village to help with the cassava harvest. Julie's mom, Helena, was born into a large family of cassava farmers in Maranhão in northeastern Brazil. After school, she moved to Sao Paulo to go to university and became a lawyer. But every year now, she returns to her family's village to help with the cassava harvest. But my journey took me from Helena, Montana to Sao Paulo, Brazil's largest city and Julie's home. There I met up with her family. We loaded our gear and set off to drive across two thirds of the country to reach our destination. But along the way, we stopped at some spectacular parks and natural areas. One such place is Tocantins. There in a dry section of the hot savanna, we found a wonderful creek that drops into a narrow slot canyon. Hiking down and walking along the bottom of the creek, we refreshed ourselves in a small waterfall situated about 80 feet underground. There was lots of spectacular scenery in that area, including some fine natural stone arches, like this one called Portal de Chapada. There's another unnamed arch that we found simply by wandering that provided gorgeous views of the countryside. This is the part of the country where the great British explorer Percy Fawcett disappeared looking for the legendary lost city of Z. On a hike, we also stumbled upon some caves with amazing ancient petroglyphs in them. This so astonished us that Later on, we hired a guide to take us to see some other petroglyphs. On the way, he told me that he'd only met one American before, and that was the astronaut Neil Armstrong. You know, I've always considered myself a seasoned traveler, but in this situation, I realized that I was really a rank amateur, as I was the only American he'd ever met who had never walked on the moon. The petroglyphs were well worth the side trip. Nearby, we got to swim in Fervedoro Springs. Fervedoro. This is a marvelous and beautiful pool of quicksand, an absolute delight to explore, and the only such place I've ever seen in the world outside of the cartoons. Here you wade into the springs which emanates from beneath an area of white sand. 
and soon you're swimming in suspended sand. It's truly amazing. And no, it doesn't suck you in. This part of the nation was only recently developed. Maranhão is the state in northeastern Brazil with a rather arid climate. It was originally largely covered with forests. But more recently, particularly in the last 30 years, the forests have been cleared for cattle ranches and agriculture by wealthy landowners and agribusiness conglomerates. Even on our trip, my companions would point out areas that we passed that were newly cleared, and I would sometimes catch a glimpse of the huge bulldozers that would clear forests by dragging heavy chains between them and tearing up all the plants in between. There are not many paved roads in this part of the country, and often a river has to be crossed by ferry. The population is spread over isolated farms and small villages situated every few miles. Most of the towns are simply connected by dirt roads that are poorly maintained and require some very skillful driving. Maranhão is close enough to the equator that there's only a wet season and a dry season. We were visiting in July, which is winter there, being south of the equator. That's the dry season in the state of Maranhão. It's a rural state inhabited largely by indigenous tribes and poor farmers, many of whom raise cassava on a small scale. It was this world that I was invited to visit. Cassava is the root vegetable that has been cultivated in South America for millennia by the indigenous peoples. It thrives in a dry environment with marginal soil. And though the root is poisonous in its raw form, it is purified and processed into many different foods. The current cassava industry is still almost exclusively dominated by small farmers. This is because the cultivation and the processing of the food does not lend itself to mechanization. Cassava farmers in Brazil still use virtually the same techniques developed by indigenous peoples thousands of years ago. Cassava is the third largest source of carbohydrates in the world and today feeds nearly a billion people. This is what I was eager to experience firsthand. Helena's village is called Persajum Velha in the state of Maranhão. Persajum Velha is a small village with maybe 120 people in the area. The road itself, which is not more than a rough dirt trail, is rather a new phenomenon being installed just 15 years ago in about 2003. Prior to that, visiting this village meant riding horses or donkeys from a town about 40 miles away and trudging through the landscape that's a mix of chaparral and swamps. However, there had just been a torrential rain that washed out portions of the road. There are two cassava harvests per year, and each requires the labor of the whole family, most of whom live nearby. We congregated at the home of Helena's oldest sister, Ida, and her husband, still in their 70s, working dawn to dusk. When we arrived at the house, there were maybe eight or ten of the family already hard at work in the backyard in what's called the oven house. That structure is little more than a roof built either with tile or a thatch made of palm fronds. And underneath it are built two large clay ovens and the various workstations for processing the cassava. I was welcomed very warmly into this household of new faces where I was truly a stranger. In fact, I was told I might be the first gringo ever to visit this village so I was somewhat of an item of curiosity. As soon as we arrived, we were offered food and drink, but we were eager to get on with the work. Within a few minutes of our arrival and after the introductions around the family, a handful of men headed out to a nearby field. We were preceded by a cousin leading a burro with two large woven baskets strung across his back, one on either side, a few hundred yards away, we came to a field which had been partially harvested. It was full of man-sized bushes, 
which are the cassava plant. I watched how the men grabbed a bush down close to the roots and vibrated it with their hands until it came loose. Pulling it up, the dirt fell away and all the tubers were then broken off and tossed into a basket. The process seemed simple enough to me, but the gringo city boy could not get the hang of it. I would tug on a plant until I tore the stem away from the root, and then one of the natives would have to come over and help me dig out the separated roots with a spade, while the others were laughing and kidding around with each other and filling up the baskets quickly. I was heaving and sweating, contributing startlingly few tubers myself for all of the effort. By the time the baskets were full and we headed back to the house, I felt like I had put in a full day's work. It had been about 15 minutes. Back at the oven house, each of the baskets of tubers was dumped on a pile in the middle of the floor. There were a handful of short little handmade wooden stools there. Someone would grab a stool and a knife and sit next to the pile with a knife in one hand, stab a tuber, and begin peeling it at a rapid rate. This circle seemed to be mostly women, although men would certainly join in when they could. All the while, a few scattered kids were playing around the perimeter, no doubt slowly picking up the process going on around them. It was a wonderful social time, and if my Portuguese had been any better, I would have enjoyed conversing with them at more than the, just the simplest level. In about an hour's time, the tubers had been peeled and thrown back into the baskets, leaving a pile of the peeling scraps, which then would be fed to the livestock. As I would discover, in this process, nothing gets wasted. Then the tubers are put in large bags and hauled down to the creeks to soak for a few days to disperse the natural cyanide that permeates the roots. This is a critical step for not poisoning the diners later. And meanwhile, while the tubers are soaking, the women can do the laundry in one of the most beautiful laundromats in the world. As the ovens were prepared, finally my sculptor's skills could come in handy, and I was put to work repairing some of the clay work on the ovens. The now clean tubers are then dumped onto a table and pushed into a trough, where a motorized blade shreds the roots into paste. This is the only electric machine I saw that could replace the very deft human handling. Then the paste is put into bags and kneaded over and over. The wastewater from this process is allowed to settle, the excess poured off, and what remains is a very fine flour, like powdered sugar. This was then broken up and dried in the sun before being stored for special uses during the year. Meanwhile, the rest of the washed paste is then put into sealed bags and laid into a giant wooden press that squeezes the water out over a few days as it is progressively tightened. I was very taken with the beauty of this handmade press. I was told it was probably 70 years old or more, but it still works as good as new. The dried flour is removed from the bags and then is sifted through a basket screen to remove fibers and prepare the flour for the last drying process. This is done by lighting fires in the two large ovens built from local clay and topped with a sheet of iron. I asked one of the men about the source of the iron and was told that these particular ones were cut off of a shipwreck, perhaps a hundred years ago, and then hauled this 50 miles or more back here on donkeys. When the fire is lit, the flour is spread onto the hot surface of the ovens and is constantly raked and spread with large paddles by the men. It is hot, constant work, so the men have to trade off, taking turns tackling that and the other rolls. When the flour reaches a certain consistency, on one oven it is picked up and transferred to the other for a finer touch. And then, at the right moment, it is collected and put into bags for storage. It is now prepared for keeping for the long term, 
and will serve the family until the next harvest. There are many uses for cassava. In Brazil, it is baked into various often hard or crunchy biscuits or flatbread, or a loose meal known as farafa, toasted in butter, sprinkled on just about any other food, or eaten alone as a side dish. I grew quite fond of it myself, which is a good thing because it appeared in every meal. Meanwhile, I got a taste for the social life of this village over the few days I was there. Since nearly everyone grows cassava, it forms the backbone of the culture. Often we would get up from our work to help the neighbors with a particular part of their processing, so I got to meet a lot of the people. I met so many, in fact, that on Sunday morning, when the village started piling into the church across the street, I felt like I recognized most of the population, even though I had only been there for three or four days. This was an unusual and extremely refreshing feeling, coming as I do from a world where generally people do not know their neighbors, even the ones living right next door. I really loved being thrust into the heart of this community. Although indoor plumbing was not uncommon, much of the village used the creek for bathing and laundry. It was my preference too, as the palm-lined creek was not only comfortable, but extremely beautiful. Periodically during the work, we would sit to rest on the front porch, as did most of the people in town. Sometimes I would even catch sight of a family sitting on the porch while watching the TV inside the house through an open window. The reason is because the main street was the hive of social activity. It seems like everyone walking down the street would either greet us while passing by or else pull up a chair and join us for conversation before they continued on their way. Although these people no doubt have the same problems that are common around the world, it sure struck me that they were happy and contented. One thing I was very curious about was how modernization was affecting their lifestyles. Although these people seemed to have cell phones and a few of them had cars, the houses were very simple. Some of the community lived in mud houses with no indoor plumbing. But oftentimes, even so, they would have a satellite dish and a big screen TV. It seemed like not only a very happy life lived close to nature, but an extremely sustainable one in a world of shrinking resources and overconsumption. For me, it was a great pleasure to see such handicrafts as bowls and troughs carved out of solid logs some of which must have been decades old, or huge tubs made out of truck tires turned inside out, or bowls resurrected from Japanese fishing floats that had washed up on the beach. I took great delight in the tools and handicrafts these people make with obvious love and care, artifacts that will no doubt become increasingly rare. I asked many of the adults if they thought their children would carry on the cassava processing tradition. They all said yes, which was no surprise with the prominence of young people that I witnessed. In fact, putting together this film, I noticed something remarkable, and I wonder if you did too. Take a look at this little kid playing on the floor of the oven house. He's repeating the same action that he saw the women doing as they sat around the circle peeling roots. However, the next door neighbor, as an older woman who was a weaver of carpets, said she was afraid she was the last in her large family to carry on that august tradition because the Chinese were making imports priced so low that she was forced to sell her work for the cost of the materials. Nevertheless, she loved her work so much that she said she would never quit even though none of her children were learning the craft. I wondered how many such artistic skills and masters of handicrafts around the world will be lost during our own generation. 
After the harvest was done, I tagged along as the family drove around in the nearby countryside to visit relatives. There I had a chance to see amazing sights and met some wonderful people. We were able to visit a number of villages called Colombos, which were founded in the 19th century as communities of escaped slaves who remained hidden in the forest for decades despite military attempts to return them to their owners. Their descendants still carve out a living in the same locations, in this case selling gorgeous handicrafts made from a grass that looks like gold wire. We visited a cousin in Paulino Neves who took us to visit a nearby exotic area filled with pristine white sand dunes interspersed by warm freshwater lakes. We spent a day or two hiking through these dunes and exploring the lakes. Here we are in the midst of the glorious sand dunes. I was introduced to spectacular trees of colors I'd never seen before, and also some amazing wildlife, such as the wild rhea, several kinds of macaws, and one day we spent some time trudging through the forest looking for what sounded for all the world like flying pigs. You can hear them in the trees. It turns out that these astonishing sounds were coming from a kind of cormorant. This adventure happened on our way to visit what well may be the very first permanent church built in the New World in the early 1500s. I was so grateful to have had this wonderful opportunity to see a country so vital to humanity's future. The wonders seemed endless. A whopping 12% of the world's forests are found in the Amazon basin, which provides a huge proportion of the Earth's clean air and water. We have no idea what undiscovered medicines or other secret treasures lie yet hidden in the depths of these forests. Unless humanity can find a way to protect this environment, the lungs of the earth, we truly imperil our future. I was so grateful to the Hirata family and their friends who allowed me this wonderful experience. It opened my eyes to the wonders of nature, the breadth of living things, and the great wisdom of the vanishing indigenous tribes that haunt these jungles, that might, in fact, hold the secrets to our future.